The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands on the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pursuing this evening a question that was asked to the Minister of Environment, to which I got a response from the Parliamentary Secretary some time ago about the policy that was put in place in 2007 by the current government to limit access to journalists to scientists working within the Canadian government. Now, I should say this extends beyond the environment as a portfolio. It affects scientists working at the National Research Council, scientists working for Natural Resources Canada, scientists working for fisheries and oceans. In point of fact, the Canadian Science Writers, a national organization, wrote to all federal leaders earlier this spring expressing their concern that this policy of muzzling scientists had actually left by their, led by their calculation to an 80% drop in media coverage of the climate crisis. I'll just list some examples. Uh, Dr. Christina Miller, I mentioned in my initial question, a Department of Fisheries and Oceans scientist, very proud of the fact that her research in science was published in this leading international prestigious uh, journal, but she was not allowed to speak to media by her department. An Environment Canada team published a paper back this spring in April, April 5th, 2011 in the Geophysical Research Letters. It concluded that a very dangerous rise in global CO2, temperature, uh, CO2 uh, increase is leading to a two degrees global average temperature increase was quite likely and might be unavoidable, but those scientists were also not allowed to speak to the media. Another type of research, the uh, scientists who are working on radiation monitoring in the wake of the Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan, uh, were requested to provide data to the news media about radiation monitoring and readings. And that request to Health Canada was denied. We also know that there was a quite almost amusing story of a journalist attempting to reach an NRC scientist based in Victoria whose research had been published internationally. Uh, this research related to a flood 13,000 years ago, but that researcher was not allowed to speak to the media. And we have the very recent story of Dr. David Tarasik, referred to just moments ago by my colleague from Atoko North, who's been doing important research on ozone monitoring. That work, along with other international colleagues, was published in the prestigious journal Nature and pointed out that there was a quite unprecedented ozone hole that had opened up over the northern Arctic. We've heard, of course, of the ozone hole over Antarctica. That's been monitored and recorded since the uh, mid-1980s. But this was the first and historically unprecedented hole opening, opening up over the Arctic. Now, interestingly enough, Dr. Tarasik was allowed to provide an interview to the media. It was a supervised interview with Environment Canada personnel present at all times, trying to steer him away from answering certain questions, but at least the interview was granted. It's also troubling to me that as a member of Parliament, for the first time in my life, when I contact scientists within the Government of Canada, they're no longer able to communicate with me. I've had them explain by emails that they'll check and get back to me whether they're allowed to answer my question. In some cases, these are colleagues I've known for decades. And because I'm a member of Parliament, they're not allowed to answer my questions. So I asked the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, how can the Canadian public have confidence in a government that doesn't allow its scientists to speak to the public that is so proud of the research, that wants to keep Canadian research on the forefront, on climate change, on ozone depletion, on fisheries scientists? How can we have confidence? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of the Environment. Well, Mr.